This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. In November of 1911, a trivial yet historically significant event would occur over the city of Ain Zarah during the Italo-Turkish War in Libya. Italian lieutenant and pilot Julio Gavodi would drop four grapefruit-sized grenades from an altitude of 600 feet onto Ottoman military positions from his Etrich Taub monoplane. While no casualties were inflicted, this event is widely accepted as the very first aerial bombardment from a heavier-than-air aircraft. Within two years, the bomber would become a staple of aerial warfare as purpose-built aircraft came into service. However, even in ideal conditions, these early bombers were limited to just three to four hours of flight time, limiting their range and flexibility. The ability to carry large ordnance loads to targets at much further distances proved to be challenging for early military aviation. At the time, in both the civil and military world, a practical method for traversing large distances, including major bodies of water without the need for service landings, was also highly sought after. Immediately after World War I, aviation development stagnated as the limited range and payload capacity of aircraft of the time offered little appeal to the public. While airframe and engine designs were constantly evolving, Air-to-air -air refueling was seen as the only immediate solution to the range extension problem, particularly for military applications. However, it would take almost three decades of experimentation with the concept for the first system to become operationally practical. The first attempts at air-to-air -air refueling were carried out as dangerous stunts performed by civilian pilots known as barnstormers at flying circuses. In these demonstrations, a crew member of the fueling aircraft would climb from its wing to the wing of the receiving aircraft with a fuel can in hand. There he would manually refuel the receiving aircraft and subsequently climb back to his own aircraft after refueling. The first true systematic attempt of in-flight refueling was conducted on October 3, 1920 in Washington, D.C. by Lt. Godfrey L. Cabot of the United States Naval Reserve. Cabot's test employed a trailing rope with an attached grappling hook fitted to his Huff Donnell aircraft. The hook was used to retrieve a five-gallon gasoline can that was floating on a raft on the Potomac River. Despite the relatively minor amount of fuel taken on, Cabot's experiment marked the very first time an aircraft's range was extended without landing for refueling. Cabot would report the results of his tests to the Army Air Corps Command, recommending the use of his grappling hook method of retrieving fuel to facilitate the transatlantic delivery of aircraft. However, his findings were not met with enthusiasm and his idea was quickly dismissed. Despite its rejection, Cabot's experiment piqued the interest of fellow aviators of the time, inspiring others to conduct their own, often hazardous, attempts at in-flight refueling. Despite the efforts, none of these attempts would yield any practical results. Finally, in 1923, World War I veteran pilots Captain Lowell Smith and Lieutenant John Richter would devise a method to deal with the flight duration limits that plagued them during combat. Under the approval of their base commander, Major H. H. Arnold at Rockwell Field in San Diego, California, and employing Richter's pre-war engineering experience, the duo created a pair of test tanker aircraft by fitting two Airco DH-4B biplanes with 50-foot hoses which could be lowered to a similar receiving aircraft. Smith and Richter had conducted their first test flight on April 20th, successfully connecting the tanker's hose to the receiving aircraft in flight and maintaining the connection for over 40 minutes, though no fuel was ever transferred. A few months later, numerous test flights were flown over a circular course, with the team achieving their first flight endurance record on June 27th at 6 hours and 37 minutes of flight time. Two months later, a flight endurance of 37 hours was achieved using nine refuelings, with over 686 gallons of fuel being transferred mid-air. By October 25th, Smith and Richter had conducted their first real-world tests by flying non-stop from Sumas, Washington to Tijuana, Mexico, using the equipment and techniques they had developed. Taking over 12 hours to complete, with refueling occurring over Eugene, Oregon and Sacramento, California, the flight served as proof of the viability of air-to-air -air refueling for military use. Despite the success of these tests, the dangers of air-to-air -air refueling would become apparent less than a month later during a crash at an air show at Kelly Field, Texas. 
Caused by a refueling hose tangling up in the propeller of the receiving aircraft, this event became the first ever fatality caused by mid-air refueling. As the 1920s progressed, aviation enthusiasts worldwide experimented with the technique in the pursuit of new aerial long-distance records. However, for the most part, air-to-air -air refueling was seen as a performing stunt by the aviation community. The next major milestone in air-to-air -air refueling would come in 1929 by Captain Ira Eaker and Major Carl Spatz with the setting of a flight endurance record of almost 151 hours that covered more than 11,000 miles, more than doubling the previous record. Under the reluctant support of the United States War Department, a group of Army Air Corps aircrew led by the two would fly two Douglas C-1 aircraft configured as tankers and a Fokker tri-motor monoplane named the Question Mark as the receiver aircraft. The tankers were fitted with an additional 150-gallon gas tank and a 40-gallon oil tank. Using the refueling technique developed by Smith & Richter, the tankers carried a 50-foot hose that would be lowered to the receiver aircraft, which itself was modified with a large fuel funnel that led to its fuselage tank. On January 1st, the Question Mark took off from Van Nuys, California and began its endurance attempt. Major Spatz would stand on a platform on the question mark in order to catch the hose lowered from the tanker and place it into the funnel. Throughout the entire flight, 42 contacts were made with the tankers, with almost 5,000 gallons of gasoline and 245 gallons of oil being transferred. Ultimately, a failure of one of the Fokker's engines led to the termination of the flight. Among the goals of the test, Eaker and Spatz had demonstrated that it was possible to transfer bomber and fighter aircraft overseas by refueling in flight. However, their report to the War Department remained largely ignored for many years, primarily due to the lack of aircraft engine reliability for long-duration operation. While some commercial interest lingered, particularly for transatlantic flights, very little attention was given to aerial refueling in the United States until after World War II. During the early 1930s in England, long-distance aviation pioneer and member of the World War I Royal Flying Corps, Sir Alan Cobham, would carry out his own studies on aerial refueling with the use of a specially adapted airspeed courier receiver aircraft and a Handley Page Type W-10 as the tanker. By 1935, Cobham would demonstrate a technique known as grapple line looped hose air-to-air -air refueling. In this procedure, the receiver aircraft would trail a steel cable which was then grappled by a line shot from the tanker. The line was then drawn into the tanker where the receiver's cable was connected to the refueling hose. The receiver would then draw back its cable, bringing the tanker's fuel hose with it. Once the hose was connected, the tanker climbed slightly above the receiver aircraft where fuel would flow under gravity. Using this technique, Cobham was able to conduct a non-stop flight from London to India using in-flight refueling to extend the flight duration. By the late 1930s, Cobham's company, Flight Refueling Limited, or FRL, would become the very first producer of a commercially viable aerial refueling system. Their looped hose design began to be used experimentally to refuel several large transatlantic crossing aircraft known as flying boats. Upon the outbreak of World War II, commercial trials of the system had ceased with attention being shifted towards military applications by the Royal Air Force. In the final year of World War II, FRL's looped hose refueling system would be equipped to Lancaster and Lincoln bombers in preparation for an offensive against Japan. However, the war had concluded before the system could ever be used in combat. After World War II, the progression into the Cold War led the United States Air Force for the first time to prioritize the development of equipment and techniques for aerial refueling due to concerns of the ability to conduct long-range operations. In March of 1948, the U.S. Air Force's Air Material Command initiated the GEM program in the hopes of developing long-range strategic capabilities through the study of aircraft winterization, air-to-air -air refueling, and advanced electronics. Within the program, Strategic Air Command was tasked with operational suitability testing of all developments. The air-to-air -air refueling program in particular was given top priority within GEM. At the time, the only proven operable refueling mechanism available worldwide was FRL's grapple line loop hose system. This led to initial testing beginning with Air Material Command procuring enough equipment from FRL to convert 100 B-29s into receivers and 60 B-29s into tankers. However, the U.S. Air Force had modified FRL's system by adding autocoupling to the refueling nozzle. 
eliminating the need to fly to a lower altitude and depressurize the aircraft for aircrew to manually couple the fuel hose. After a year of training and testing with the modified FRL air-to-air -air refueling system, it would be used by the B-50 Superfortress Lucky Lady 2 of the 43rd Bomb Wing to conduct the first non-stop flight around the world. Taking off on February 26, 1949, Lucky Lady 2 flew non-stop around the world in 94 hours and 1 minute, with four aerial refuelings from four pairs of B-29-based tankers. The flight started and ended at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, with the refuelings occurring near the Azores, Saudi Arabia, the Philippines, and Hawaii. While the famous flight proved to be successful and was relatively uneventful, one of the tankers was lost in a landing mishap, killing the crew of nine. While the around-the-world flight demonstrated, in effect, unlimited range for aircraft under aerial refueling, it was discovered that FRL's system was not practical for widespread use. It was unwieldy and difficult to use, and had the additional disadvantage of using components manufactured overseas. This led to the Air Force seeking out a better solution. After experiencing the operational limitations during the testing with FRL's grapple-line loophole system, General Curtis LeMay, commander of the U.S. Air Force's Strategic Air Command, requested that Boeing develop a refueling system that could transfer fuel at a higher rate than was currently possible. The solution to the problem came in the form of a flying boom refueling concept, first conceptualized in 1948 by German scientist B. A. Holman while working for Material Air Command. The system went from idea to operational testing in less than two years. The flying boom aerial refueling system is based on a telescoping rigid fueling pipe that is attached to the rear of a tanker aircraft. The entire mechanism is mounted on a gimbal, allowing it to move with the receiver aircraft. The fueling nozzle at the end of the pipe is attached via a flexible ball joint. This nozzle is designed to mate with a matching fuel receiver receptacle, and within it, a poppet valve prevents the flow of fuel until it's properly mated. Once the nozzle is mated to the receptacle, a locking mechanism engages for the duration of the fuel transfer. What makes the flying boom design so effective is its ability to be steered by an operator. This is accomplished by a pair of small hydraulically controlled moving airfoils that when combined with the telescoping action of the boom can be used to fly the nozzle towards the receiver's receptacle. In a typical flying boom aerial refueling scenario, the receiver aircraft rendezvous with the tanker and maintains formation. The receiver aircraft then moves to an in-range position behind the tanker under signal lights or radio guidance from the boom operator. Once in position, the operator extends the boom to make contact with the receiver aircraft, where fuel is then pumped through the boom. The first flight test of the flying boom system was done on September 16, 1948 using a reconfigured B-29. It proved to be highly effective as it was far more stable, permitting refueling at higher speeds. It was also more resistant to weather interference and lightning strikes. It also could pass up to 500 gallons of fuel per minute whereas FRL's system peaked at around 100 gallons per minute. It performed so well that shortly after the Lucky Lady flight, it was decided that further procurement of FRL's system was no longer necessary, and the flying boom became the standard of Strategic Air Command, with receptacles being installed on all future bombers. Between 1950 and 1951, 116 B-29s were converted by Boeing to KB-29 flying boom tankers. Simultaneously, Boeing would develop the world's first production aerial tanker, the KC-97 Stratofreighter. While the KC-97 was effective, its piston engines required gasoline while jet-powered aircraft operated on a kerosene-based fuel system. Furthermore, the slower cruise speed of the tanker forced some jet engine-powered aircraft to slow dangerously close to their stall speeds in order to mate with the tanker's boom. Over the next few years, these issues would be addressed with Boeing's development of the first high-altitude, high-speed, jet-powered, flying boom aerial tanker, the KC-135 Stratotanker. Based on the Boeing 367-80 airframe, over 730 of these aircraft would be built and deployed over the next decade. The KC-135 revolutionized aerial refueling with its ability to carry up to 30,000 gallons of fuel which could be both consumed and offloaded to receiving aircraft. It could refuel at speeds as slow as 180 knots and as fast as 350 knots, covering the needs of every aircraft within the Air Force's inventory. It was also flexible, being able to carry up to 80,000 pounds of cargo and as many as 250 passengers if needed. 
Since its first flight on July 15, 1954, the KC-135 has been one of six military fixed-wing aircraft with over 50 years of continuous service. It quickly became the primary refueling system of the U.S. Air Force, with contemporary versions of its flying boom system being able to pass fuel at up to 1,000 gallons a minute. As the United States Air Force was developing the flying boom system, it simultaneously requested that Sir Alan Cobham improve FRL's grapple line loop hose refueling system, specifically to accommodate fighter aircraft use. By 1949, Cobham had devised the first probe and drogue aerial refueling system. Probe and drogue refueling employs a flexible hose that trails behind the tanker aircraft. A power drogue called a basket is attached at its narrow end to a valve which itself is fitted to the flexible hose via a ball joint coupling, which in modern variants allow for up to 22 degrees of misalignment. During aerial refueling, the drogue stabilizes the hose in flight and provides a funnel to guide the insertion of a matching refueling probe that extends from the receiver aircraft. The probe is generally fitted to the nose or fuselage and it contains a valve which opens when mated with the drogue's forward internal receptacle, permitting fuel flow. On most high-speed aircraft, the fueling probe is designed to be retracted when not in use. In order to preserve the drogue and protect the receiver aircraft from structural damage from sudden large aerodynamic loads while in contact, the probe valve end is designed to break off at a purposely designed structural weak point, forming a mechanical fuse to the connection. When refueling operations are complete, the hose is then reeled up completely into an assembly known as the hose drum unit. Operational testing of the first probe and drogue refueling system began in 1950 under the supervision of World War II fighter ace Colonel Dave Schilling due to the fighter-specific nature of its design purpose. Schilling would go on to improve on the design and prove its use with multiple aircraft simultaneously. This multi-drogue configuration offered a distinct advantage over the flying boom system. In 1952, the United States Air Force decided to give probe and drogue refueling a full-scale operational test under combat conditions in Korea. F-84Es of the 116th Fighter Bomber Wing were equipped with probes, and KB-29 tankers were equipped with drogues on their wingtips and tails. Using the probe and drogue system, a new endurance record for a single-engine fighter would be set over Korea at 14 hours and 15 minutes over five combat missions without landing. By the 1960s, aerial refueling had become a routine operation, with the probe and drogue system becoming the more popular choice globally. Because of its modular nature, hardpoint pods that were self-contained hose drum units would be developed. Known as buddy pods, they allowed a range of aircraft, including other fighters, to function as tankers. Additionally, adapter units were developed that converted the ends of flying boom refueling pipes to drogues for cross-system tanker compatibility. The Prorogue and Drogue system proved to be so versatile that it became standardized by NATO, the US Navy and Marines, and several Army aircraft. The standardization allowed drogue-equipped tanker aircraft to refuel probe-equipped aircraft from other nations. The Soviet Union would even reverse engineer and adopt the NATO hose and drogue system, effectively making them compatible with NATO tankers. Over the next 50 years, aerial refueling would become commonplace in military use, forming a key element in mission planning. From a technical standpoint, the reliability and effectiveness of these systems had led to very little change since their development in the 1950s. However, in recent years, the emergence of unmanned aerial vehicle research would take aerial refueling beyond what was thought to be possible during the early days of aviation. On June 4th, 2021, the US Navy conducted its first ever aerial refueling between a manned aircraft and an unmanned tanker using a Boeing MQ-25 Stingray and a Navy F-18 Super Hornet. Conducted over Mascota, Illinois, the four and a half hour test flight performed a series of both wet and dry contacts with the UAV with a total of 10 minutes of total contact time and transferring around 50 gallons of fuel. The MQ-25 program represents a larger venture towards a future where carrier-based fleets are augmented by unmanned systems. At the current trajectory of the program, the Navy expects initial operational capabilities to occur around 2025. With an estimated one-third of Super Hornet flight hours being spent on refueling missions, the paradigm of how refueling is implemented in mission planning may ultimately change drastically as large lingering manned tankers are slowly pushed into obsolescence.
It seems like a simple idea, connecting a fuel line between two aircraft to transfer fuel. But like most simple ideas, in practice, the complexity of the true scope of all variables involved begin to reveal themselves. Being able to quantify and measure the elements of a system are key to problem solving. Have you ever wanted to build a stronger understanding of the concepts of measurement and how to apply them? Well, there's a free and easy way to get started immediately. That's where Brilliant.org comes in. Brilliant.org is my go-to tool for diving headfirst into learning a new concept. Concept. It's a website and app built off the principle of active problem solving. Because to truly learn something, it takes more than just watching it. You have to experience it. Brilliant is constantly developing their courses to offer the most visual, hands-on approach possible to make mastering the key concepts behind today's technology effective and engaging. One solid starting point I highly recommend is Brilliant's measurement course. In this course, you'll explore some of the foundational ideas of mathematical measurement and its relationship to quantifying the aspects of the physical world using an incredible incredibly intuitive set of exercises that will open your eyes to a new way of looking at things. With Brilliant, you learn in depth and at your own pace. It's not about memorizing or regurgitating facts. You simply pick a course you're interested in and get started. If you feel stuck or made a mistake, an explanation is always available to help you through the learning process. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days and start learning STEM today, visit brilliant.org forward slash new mind or click on the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.